Hi, Nick. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for taking the time to have a chat today. No worries, Brady. Good to, uh, good to be on. Yeah, it's um, it's been a crazy time. I kind of like to do these interviews in person, but Zoom is our friend at the moment and uh, this is where we're at. So um, where did it all start for you, Nick? You're obviously a golfer yourself. Um, where did it all begin? Uh, oh, for me, from a from a personal golfing point of view, from yeah. a real young age out in country Victoria, um, grew up down in, down in Gippsland, um, Sweet. started my golf at Maui golf club. Um, oh, and, um, yeah, it was, uh, started out there at six years old, um, first handicap at 10, um, and pretty much played all my junior golf at Maui and, and also growing up in the country, really lucky with, you know, the price of junior memberships, I think way back then was about 30 to $40 at each club. So oh, I was also a member at Yulong Golf Club at the, at the same time. They're only, you know, three there minutes apart from each other. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, obviously getting down there this year where you played well at Yulong uh, yeah, for the Gippsland I, Super 6, finishing second. So I didn't go. know you. I didn't know you were a member there. Jeez, far out. Yeah. I, could, I should ask you for some advice in some of the holes, but... <laughs> Well, you didn't need too much, mate. Finishing one back, so no, that's all right. We'll we'll get it next year if uh, well this year. I'm kind of missing my years up, but <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. from there, from there, I, I moved down to Melbourne at um, at about twenty years old to start my PGA traineeship at uh, at Long Island, what was Long Island Country Club then, and and now um, has merged with with the National, and it completed my traineeship there in the early two thousands, and and then went out and. Tried to do what you do for uh, about golf, seven or right? eight years, yeah, and um, and played mainly in Australia. Um, spent a couple of years over playing some sort of mini tours and secondary stuff over in in Europe, and um, you know started a family uh, in two thousand and eight, yep. and pretty much hung the clubs up in two thousand and nine. Um, yeah, once I realised I couldn't make enough money to sustain myself, my wife, and uh, and having a family. Yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not for everyone this traveling golf life, um, especially if you're going to raise a family. Um, it's just yeah, it is tough. Um, then you kind of transition to that state manager role. Was that kind of the prompting of the family, or just you sort of plateau? Or uh, no, first of all, I um, when I first finished playing, I, I worked for the PGA in a different role as a tournament coordinator for, okay. for three years yep. um, here in Vic, for Vic Taz and, and SA and. And then after leaving that role, I went and um, was a general manager of Long Island Country Club, where I'd completed my traineeship. Yeah. Spent four years there. Um, and that was through the merger with the National, um, yep. which was a great time to be the, the general manager of Long Island and, and go through that experience of, of bringing two golf clubs together. Um, so I learned, learned a hell of a lot doing that. Um, it was a, an amazing um, thing to be a part of. And then stayed on just over a year post that merger going through and, and everything was sort of bedded down by that stage. And, and then another opportunity came up to, to go back to the PGA as, as the state manager um, for, yeah. for Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia and spent a bit over three years in, in that role before um, moving over into the tournament's director of Australasia role, which I sit in now. Yeah, um, yeah, I kind of came back to Australia to start playing all the events and kind of saw your name around and we got to know each other a bit last year and um, you obviously moved into this uh, tournament director's role. Is, is that is that the official title of the Australasia Tour? That's the, I think that's, that's it. it. Yep. That's it. Tour yeah, I Tournaments just, director Australasia it is. Yeah, it's a, a tongue tongue twister for me, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's exciting. It's good. It's always good. Um, I kind of noticed this in Latino America, a lot of a lot of ex players, they definitely always have the best. Um, not, 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 not like before they don't have the, I'm not saying that uh, people that aren't players, they don't have the, the best interests of the players, but it's, it's nice to see a fellow player that's been in the shoes um, kind of get into a role like you are right now. And, you know, we put a lot of trust in Nick in, um, and, and Kim yourself or Kim I mix that all up. But uh, yeah, like <laughs> it is, it is great to uh, have two of you guys in that position. Um, What's the what's your um, mission statement? I guess, or what's your vision for the tour post COVID? Uh, well, yeah. Look, I mean, we are obviously in in pretty unique and, and difficult times at the moment, and mm. and a lot of uncertainty. And um, you know, I feel for certainly feel for all the players out there at the moment who, like yourself, um, just don't have anything to compete in. So so it is difficult. And I guess the 
the initial <laughs> mission statement is to try and get um, try and get tournament golf back up and running yeah. uh, as soon as we can Stage. once it's safe to do so and 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 we can get you guys out there playing and, and giving you an opportunity to try and try and earn a living. Um, it's an extremely tough time time for you all. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the immediate future. Um, you know, we're we're clearly in a in a pretty bad spot at the moment, particularly here in Victoria, um, with with no feels at times no end in sight. But Absolutely. I'm sure yeah. that um, you know this current six week uh, stage four lockdown we're in. Um, if everyone does the right thing and, and we come out of this in a better position, you know, the, the one thing I've learned, I guess, over the, the last number of months is, is things do change pretty quick and, and they mm. have been changing very quickly throughout this. So whilst at the moment we probably feel like, you know, a bit of despair, uh, I'm sure that um, there's every chance that that could turn around pretty quickly as well. And um, I'm hopeful that, you know, the end of the year and if not the end of the year by early in the new year, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, have a good run of tournaments, um, be able to string, string together multiple weeks um, and, and have an exciting time out on golf course. Um, you know, we, we've got a great opportunity, I think, uh, early in the year with, with international travel still being limited. And, you know, it's, it's tough when you, yeah. you sit back this morning and you watch the US PGA playing oh. and, PGA Tour back at it and, and um, you know, and, and we can't at the moment. Um, but I guess that's the difference of, of the two different countries at the moment. I mean, America, there's no border closures. You know, they're, they're basically travelling throughout America and, and it's a lot easier to run a tour that way than, than yeah. here in Australia at the moment where we're, we're effectively like seven or eight different countries. Yeah. You know, it crossing into house, from Victoria. Know. Exactly. Crossing into different borders at the moment. Um, as is challenging as as challenging as as hopping from country to country. So mm. so that's where our difficulties are at the moment. But but long term, um, you know, we've we've got some great things planned, particularly with the player series and and yeah. trying to create more opportunities um, for not only the guys but also the uh, the girls uh, in the country and and playing opportunities where. You know, hopefully by playing well in, in those opportunities that we create, we can create some opportunities to get onto overseas tours as well. Yeah, with the um, I kind of saw the initiative with the player series. You're kind of in, trying to incorporate the the women and the, a bit of the seniors as well. Is that the kind of you're trying to get like a, uh, bit no, of a no seniors as such, okay. but but I guess some of our um, some of our legendary players over the years whether they be current or past so okay like ogilvy you know, and those kind of guys yeah yeah so each of the events will have an association with one of our you know one of our homegrown stars over the years so yeah. you used ogilvy there as an example we yeah. featured jeff in in a couple of the um soft digital launch you know the teasers yeah, that yeah. we put out back yeah. just pre-covid happening yeah. um and um, yeah, Jeff's very much um, going to be a part of it, and um, and keen to be involved. As a, we we sat down and spoke with um, and pretty much all of our leading players, leading current players, and, and a few of the older generation over over the sort of summer period when we had the Australian Open and the Australian PGA, and yeah. got some great feedback um, from the likes of Carrie Webb, um, Jeff, as you mentioned, Mark Leishman, Adam Scott. Um, so, you know, Ian Baker, Finch, a couple of the older guys. So we've, we've had some, some great chats with them. Um, and, you know, the good news is I guess all of our players want to see our tour succeed and, and want to help in some way and be a part of it. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's exciting. Hopefully, I think it's September the 17th when we kind of get out of this lockdown and then hopefully a couple of weeks or month after that, they eventually open interstate borders um have you guys had any correspondence with like the government at all about like we're all i guess we're all in the dark with this but maybe the pga had a i don't know an extra phone line or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> the bat phone the bat phone, um, yeah. yeah look um we do um you know it's different with it's very much the states um to a certain degree on, on this front so it, it's yeah. dealing with uh each of the various state governments and and health officers um you know, the, the simple answer is that, you know, I guess we, we sort of look at the AFL to some degree and the NRL yeah. and what they're doing yeah. and, and think, well, why can't, why can't we do that from a golf point of view? But Like, like the um, hub life or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I guess we're talking about totally different 
budgets of organisations and mm. and also we're talking teams when it comes to to those sports. Whereas you know all you guys are, are effectively independent independent contractors. Mm. Um, you know, traveling on say the one plane into the, the one state, staying there for, for multiple weeks, having to hub and quarantine. So one thing that the, the AFL have had to do and, you know, they've, they've transferred multiple teams at the one time. And they've, mm. whilst they've been in that 14 day um, isolation and um, quarantine, they've played those teams against each other. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're basically, they haven't left a bubble. Um, mm. So they haven't had any exemptions from the 14 day quarantine or, or anything like that. And, um, you know, for, for our guys, if you were to say, get a special exemption to fly into Western Australia to be able to play a couple of events, you would still need to quarantine for 14 days. And, and that's $2,800. Yeah. It's $200 a day. Cause it's it's um, yeah. it's different over there. It's not you can't like here. I think it was you can go to your house and you could they just check on you every two weeks. I think they're very strict in WA. It's like military take you to your hotel room and it's all at your own expense. I think you've missed the window of like getting a free yeah, and, and that's the same in multiple states now as well. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, those expenses, you know, for for the type of money a lot of our events are playing for, make it mm. um, cost prohibitive for any of the guys to actually travel and and do that. So. Um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, 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 it's tough navigating our way through all this at the moment because yeah. it's, it's not like there's a rule book and it's been done before where we're sort no, of, no. um, learning as we go to a certain degree. Yeah. I guess everyone's just doing their best. I, I definitely don't want to be in your shoes. It sounds really tough or Dan Andrews <laughs> shoes or anything or it's just, it just sounds, it just looks too hard. Um, definitely un unprecedented times with everything. Um, yeah, I guess the, you know, obviously the Aussie Open got postponed, didn't get cancelled, which is great. Um, it might be postponed till the big open around. It's all speculation, yep. kind of read about all that stuff. But I guess what's the, like, obviously, hopefully interstate borders open and we don't have to quarantine at the like, players' expenses and stuff. Like, you would, um, what's the latest date you kind of make the call to kind of push everything to next year? Is it you guys speaking about that at the moment? Cause I'm hearing the yeah. AFL are talking about the grand final, like the end of this month, they're making a call, whether it's Gabba or Perth, but it, yeah, it's such evolving news and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're getting pretty close to that point with, yep. with a number of events at the moment where, you know, we either need to make the call of pushing into, into early next year or, or, um, or trying to press ahead with, with the dates we have. Yep. Um, you know, we, the Australian Open, like you said, made an announcement recently about um, postponing and, and we haven't got a fixed date yet on that, but are looking at that early part of next year. Um, and it clearly makes sense to be around that period of when, when the Vic Open is. So we're still working through that at the moment. Um, you know, we have this, the same uh, issues with, with the other tournaments that were, were due to be played at the end of the year and, yeah, and the ability tricky. to run them. Um, you know, we, we had... Gippsland Super 6 and Vic PGA as an example here in Victoria as well, um, due to be played in, in November. Yeah. Sitting here in, in lockdown at the moment, um, yeah. you wouldn't think that that's going to be possible, but I said before, you, you never know. Um, but I think at some stage over the next sort of two to three weeks, we'll be in a pretty clear position on whether we're pushing everything back or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the two Western Australian events, um, you know, we're, we're pretty much at that point now where they, they can't run as tour events in October. That that's pretty clear to see because we're not going to get, we're not going to be able to get everyone from interstate over there to play in that's October. I and mean, it's only, it's only six or so weeks away. So. Um, yeah. It's, it's, such, yeah. it's such, such a shame. I think uh, a lot of my friends keep joking with me, just use your WA passport to get over the border, but it doesn't work <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. I'm in Victoria now, so I'm stuck over it, but yeah, it's, it, it, it is a shame, um, especially because the golf clubs are keen to, you know, run those events and stuff. It's yep. not like the sponsorship isn't there. It's just like it's unfair to the players if only WA players can play or big players can play the big PGA and your lawn. It, it's just, it's tricky. Um, yeah, but all these all these deadlines are coming up. I'm sure a lot of the players are, you know, you probably get emails and texts every day. I, I kind of thought I'd... Yeah, I must say, Brady, the, the players have been really good throughout this okay. process yeah. yeah i take take calls between 
you know, between any of our tour team, um, we all take calls from, from different players. Certain players feel more comfortable ringing, whether it's myself, Kim, Graham yeah. Scott, James Nichols. So we all yeah. take calls at, at different times, but yeah. I, we're certainly not inundated with them and the players have been yeah. um, fantastic in their understanding of the situation and, and understanding that we probably don't have all the answers either that no, we'd like to be able doing, to have you're doing your best. So yeah. the, the beauty that we do have and, you know, the call we made a few months ago to extend the season and, and revert back to a wraparound season like the PGA Tour of Australasia had back in the sort of 80s, 90s and right to the early 2000s. Um, yep. You know, with that season going through to the end of March now, you know, we, we do have the ability to move some of those events that were in the November, December period into early next year and, and they'll still form part of this season, um, which is a, a great positive. Um, it gives us an opportunity to, to still complete a season this year um, rather than, you know, the, the four events that, are, that have been played as part of our tour so far in the early part of the year. Mm. So, um, so that gives us a, a great chance to complete a 2021 season. Um, crown and order merit champion yeah um you know give give players like yourself that are trying to work up through the um yeah. through the categories a chance to to do that and um yeah we're, we're still confident we'll get in a season it's just when it's, that season's back underway yeah. is is the question well yeah i'm looking at it because obviously the P, the pga champ started today and i'm saying there could be seven majors in 11 months or something crazy like we could we could find ourselves in the same kind of situation with you know, if Vic opens the first event and then you just, you literally run all the events after that till right to the end of March after that, it could be just who's the hottest at the moment gets the title. It kind of seems like that because you, you're rolling Vic, you're rolling next year's Vic Open and New Zealand Open a part of that as well. Um, have you had, had any correspondence with those uh, tournament organisation people to... Yep, for for New Zealand you're talking about? Yeah, New, New Zealand and... Uh, yeah. yeah, New Zealand, yeah. They still confident. Yeah, absolutely. And, we... Yeah. We catch up um, with our friends over there, Michael Gladding and, and mm. John Hart um, in particular. We catch up with them, you know, every few weeks uh, online like this and, and have a yeah. chat about where things are at. And, um, yeah, they're, they're very much um, hopeful of being able to run the New Zealand Open. Yeah, um, not only, look, th there is a chance that to the same level as last year with, you know, with the, we had the Asian tour part of it and the Japanese, t we had 20 players from Japan as well, part of it. And, and a lot of the amateurs that come in and play that unique format yeah. come from Asia and Japan to play it. Um, the chances of, of that in sort of February, uh, you know, 50, 50 at, yeah, at best tough. to be able to have all those countries coming in, but we're certainly really hopeful that there will be some form of trans trans Tasman bubble by that yeah. point in time where, where at least the Australians and New Zealanders can um, travel freely. And, you know, having played that event, you, you understand that it relies yeah. heavily on the amateurs and, and a lot of them come from Australia as well yeah. as some from Asia and, and Japan. So um, if we can travel back and forth between New Zealand at that point in time, um, they're yeah. very much committed to making sure that that event goes ahead. So um, yeah. that's uh, towards the end of February, that event's scheduled for. Yeah, well, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything kind of progresses like it is. Um, I think another challenge would be all the, the all the European tour events, you know, all the PGA and Vic Open. It's kind of hopefully just hope this country just, especially one state. It just it feels like when you're in Victoria, it just feels like, geez, if it if one state wasn't this bad, we might have a chance with this. But I don't know. Six weeks is still, you know, it's still a lot before all those events are scheduled to run. So yeah, the tour hopefully is confident that they will go ahead. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, what the events will, whether they'll look the exact same as last yeah. year is, is probably what the question is. But yeah, um, yeah we're confident of, of being able to run those events in, in some form and yeah. and working with what we've got, basically, yeah, and, and the situation we're in at the time. Um, you know, we, when when we look at it, we're still, you know, we're still nearly pretty much six months away from a big open date type thing, you know, mm -hmm. the, the start of February there. So, yeah. So we do have time. Um, yep, we have time on our side at the moment. Um, and, yeah, really how we come out of this six weeks is is going to give us a probably a lot clearer picture of, of where things sit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going, going back to your wraparound season stuff, I loved it from the get-go as soon as I saw the email. Um, just going back to the glory days of, you know, the 80s all the way up to the thousands where they 
had a lot of those key players coming down from other, you know, from the States and all that and having a lot of events. Uh, definitely love the idea. Is that kind of the, going back to that model, are you trying to get this up to 18 events um, or just another feeder to tour? Is that the goal for, you know, the, that yeah. Initiative? Yeah. I think, um, you know, when we look at our tour, we've, we've got some key, um, some key traditional and, and bigger events in the Australian Open, uh, the Australian PGA Championship, and in more recent times, obviously the Vic Open being been elevated to that point of, um, and then New Zealand Open. So, yeah. you know, if if we were to fast forward three to five years from now, if we had sort of five, maybe six events at that, you know, one and a half, two million dollar mm-hmm. um, range, that would be a good outcome as long as we have at least sort of 14 to 15 events sitting underneath that, um, that are all about giving you guys opportunities to play and develop and, and become better tournament golfers with opportunities to get onto some overseas tours, some exemptions, you know, into, into final stages of qualifying schools, some exemptions into some Mm -hmm. tournaments, um, you know, perhaps some, perhaps there's an opportunity for some cards onto certain tours, like sort of challenge tour. And, you know, we have, we have so many good players here in Australia and, yeah. and so many players that I, that I have no doubt that if, if the likes of, you know, yourself, um, you know, that I could reel off 10 names, but I won't in case I leave someone out who gets offended, but <laughs> don't, don't do that. Know, yeah. <laughs> that ability for, for you guys, if, if you got over and had a full, full card on the challenge tour, I got no doubt that you could play a full year and finish mm. in that top 15, 20 and, and secure your European tour playing rights. You know, we, mm. we have a lot of quality players that are capable of doing that. It's just getting those opportunities and, and getting over there. So, so we need our tour to be able to provide those. And, and that mm. is through one volume of tournaments so that you do become a better tournament yep. player and, and you are playing more tournament golf. Yep. Uh, and two, by playing well in our tournaments, having opportunities to get overseas and, and secure those opportunities over there. No, it is. It's, it's exciting. Hopefully we can get back to that. And I'm excited to be back in Australia. It's obviously a great country to live in, regardless of the situation. Um, but yeah, that's kind of targeting all the state opens, PGAs back in um, all those states. Uh, hopefully it can get back there to the glory days of the 80s, where it was just crazy, man. Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing that we, we need to be realistic about too is, is back in the 80s and 90s, um, the PGA tour of America didn't go for 49 weeks of the year and the European tour didn't go for 46, 48 weeks of the year. Yeah. Um, there was, there was definite gaps and there was that ability for us to, to have our time to shine effectively. Yeah. Um, and there was no such thing as PGA tour China and, and all these other tours that have, I, I guess, popped up around the world. Um, but, we still have a significant part to play and a, and a significant place in, in the golfing world. And, and we still produce so many good players and, and are a big part of world golf. So we need to be able to make sure that we, we have the events. Um, and, and from time to time, we get the superstars coming down to play. And, you know, having two or three superstars at, at some of our biggest events is, is great. Um, having things every now and again, like the President's Cup, here mm. in Australia and, and World Cup of Golf and things like that go a long way to promoting golf and, and giving the Australian public the opportunity to see those superstars out and playing. And it gives all of our um, younger players something to aspire to as well. So um, yeah. we still very much have a place to play on the golfing calendar. It's just that that's probably shrunk a little bit from where it was in, in the nineties, unfortunately. Yeah. But you know, it's like you were saying before, the talent is still here and the opportunity to, you know, get those players overseas and really show how great our golfers are down here is, uh, yeah, just a, if we had a bit of a springboard, a bit more of a springboard, we'll get there eventually. Um, but yeah, thanks for kind of not clearing all that stuff. It's nice to hear it out loud. You know, I kind of yep. re- read a lot about it. Um, kind of have my set play to different tours around the world. And, you know, there's, there is such an opportunity here in Australia to, you know, really craft that opportunity for sure. Um, yeah, but yeah, definitely. Thanks for uh, taking the time, Nick. Uh, I like to always end this segment with uh, one question. You can kind of ask me anything you like, kind of add a bit of fun to it, but yeah, go for it. Um, okay. So, Brady, you obviously had an outstanding amateur career. Yep. Um, 
upon turning professional, what was your um, goal as a professional and, and how long, I guess, did you feel like it would take to, to belong at a professional level and, and reach the lofty goals that I'm sure you've set for yourself? Um, I, I think it was three years I gave myself to uh, get on a main tour, like a, either it was like Europe, PJ Tour, web.com or like Japan. That was kind of like my three years and um, I kind of threw all my eggs in the basket of the PGA tour stuff. So miss web.com, I think three times at second stage by one or two. It was just like, that's the second, that's the hardest second stage in the world. There's like mm. 80 people for 15 spots. It's like, it's a nightmare. It's in winter in the States. It's like, you can get, I think I got one place. I got Mississippi once and it was just horrendous. It was cross grain. It was just terrible. But yeah, I gave myself three years and then I missed in Latino just to just miss uh, web.com like through the categories. I think you had to finish top 10 to get web finals, which gave you a web.com status. So yeah, I gave myself three years. I stayed in the States for five. I probably should have came home after three and, you know, kind of worked my way up. Yeah, lost a bit of confidence staying over there too long, but you kind of learn from all those mistakes. So I don't, don't regret it at all, but I think three, three years was kind of my deal with it that kind of helped i had a couple of sponsors that that was kind of the three-year deal as well so um it yep. definitely helped me with that timeline but i think that's realistic i think i think people that go get their seven starts and just think they're going to be on the pga tour it's not it's not that easy you know you see you see people do it on the tour and you kind of go oh, it's, it's that easy it's it's not like it's yeah, they're they're the one out of the box. Someone that does that, aren't they? One out of the box. The average age of the rookie on the PGA Tour is like thirty four. That's like hasn't changed in years. It's kind of you got to get your head around that. You, you see Rory and you see like Jordan Spieth and all that. It's kind of like these, everyone does it like that, but it's not like that. Um, I think people need to be realistic about it and just uh, just keep getting better as you turn professional. That's one thing I noticed. As soon as you turn pro, you kind of your progress stops a bit. Um, you kind of need to maintain because you're trying to play and travel and just be everywhere. Your Monday qualifiers, or um, I definitely gave that a crack in the states for my first two, three years. Yeah, it was nuts, but yeah, learn a lot from it. Um, but yeah, re realistically, three years is probably you should you, you got to know whether you're good enough or not. Can I ask a quick follow one up? On yeah, the top go of that then. Well, it's going to be one B, one B. <laughs> Righto, one B. Do you? Um do you feel like you can get to a point over the next couple of years to get back over there? Yeah, absolutely. If the, if the events are here, I'm definitely a better player now. Um, I definitely feel like I, I look back a lot of old videos of swings and what I was doing. I was like, geez, I thought I had it figured out at 23. I definitely didn't um, kind of reflecting, especially you've got so much time now and lockdown, you can kind of reflect on a lot of things. Um, yeah. If, if there's, if there's a tour to play here and I can, you know, get, any exemptions to play on a European tour or Asia or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely feel more prepared going over there now, knowing what I yeah, know now I've learned over the years. Um, Cause I, you know, I've played lots of PJ tour events, played Euro events, I played a major. So it's kind of like, that's got to be worth something in my mind, you know, and yeah, my, sure. my, my skills have gotten better. It's kind of, I don't know. I kind of, I'll probably matured a lot at 27, 28. Um, I, I don't think I was ready at 23, weirdly. I don't think, as I was saying before, it's a, that 1% that gets through with their yeah. seven starts. Um, I wasn't ready at that time, like probably emotionally. Like it's a big jump. I moved from Australia to, the, to Texas. That's kind of the crazy move. But um, yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> uh, learned a lot from it. I uh, wouldn't take it back, but yeah, that's... Uh, very good. With the opportunities, if we can get them, hopefully we do. I think we've got the right men in the right spot to push that for us and uh yeah that's that's where we'll leave it one b you don't want a one c or anything <laughs> no no that's that's fine I, I look forward to watching over the next few years yeah no sweet thanks uh thanks for your time nick uh definitely appreciate it um i'll talk to you soon no worries appreciate it cheers, cheers brody